Okay, so join me in this effort. Take your Bible, if you have one with you, and what we're going to do is just open it straight down the middle. Okay, everybody with me so far? You should, if you turned right down the middle of your Bible, ended up in like Psalms or Proverbs. Right down the middle of most Bibles, that's where you land. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the left, if you start turning through your Bible, and we're going to end up in Ezra. And I know for many people, when I mentioned the book of Ezra, most people were like, that's a book? Um, And that's okay. But I got to tell you, over the next two months, as we meet and we open God's Word, we're going to walk through two books, Ezra and then Nehemiah, which if you looked back in history, used to be one book. Ezra and Nehemiah is a shared history over one particular time in history. So let's do the backstory. Before we jump into the text today, let's talk about where we are in Bible history. All of Scripture gives us the history of God's people leading towards a Savior that was promised named Jesus. Everything post-Jesus is a reminder that Jesus is coming again and that we as his people, those who claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, need to be sharing our faith and refining our faith until he returns. That's how the Bible lays out. In Ezra, what's happened before the book of Ezra is tragic. Some of y'all know the story of King David, a magnificent king called by God after Saul, a king that the people chose because he was tall and handsome and looked the part. God now ordains David to be king over Israel. And he is a man after God's heart. He seeks God's plan. Now, the problem happens that David sins. And David's sin has a ripple effect through history. First, We know that David dies and his son Solomon takes over. Solomon's given the opportunity by God to choose how God would bless him. And Solomon chooses wisdom. So because of that, God gives Solomon not only wisdom, but power and influence. And as time goes on, the kingdom of God is established so differently because Solomon builds a temple to God north of the city of David. And it's magnificent. It's ornate. It is opulent. It is amazing. It is a sight to be seen. And Solomon follows God's plan for where God would dwell. When when the temple is finished being built, the presence of God descends and houses at the temple. God lives amongst the people again. Prior to that, he lived in the wilderness temple. Remember that story in Scripture? But now he's living in the city with God's people. It's awesome. The problem is that after Solomon, the curse of what David did in his sin rests on the kingdom. And the kingdom that was powerful and united breaks into two pieces. A northern kingdom that takes the name of Israel. And a southern kingdom that takes the name of Judah. It's where we eventually get the name Jew. Um, These two kingdoms separate and form two separate kingdoms. One to the north, big and robust. One to the south that encapsulates God's kingdom and where he dwells. In time, there is 39 individual kings that will be over these two kingdoms. Only eight of the 39 pursue God's plan. They tear down high places. They return the people to God. Eight out of 39 possible leaders. What happens is that in the northern kingdom, after they continuously turn away from God, which by the way, do you know how many kings in the northern kingdom, this Israel, pursued the heart of God? Zero. Of the possible kings in the northern kingdom that could have followed God's heart, not one of them does so. I believe it's because they lost heart of where God was at. Because of that, they could not pursue God. And because of that, in time, they are overtaken. They are wounded and they are taken away in 721 B.C. by the Assyrian army. And they are wiped clean. They are brainwashed. They are taken in. It is a massacre. And then, 
after king after king quits following after God's heart in the land of Judah, this southern kingdom, in comes the largest moment in history for an enemy. The Babylonians step forward. Not only do they conquer everything around them, they also take in Judah and they decimate it. They go into God's temple and they wreck it and they steal all of the items out and they completely destroy the nation. What's left is sadness. We get that the prophet uh, Jeremiah in 29 10 and Jeremiah says this, for this is what the Lord says, when 70 years from Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and I will confirm my promise concerning you to restore to you to this place. Jeremiah tells the people, Babylon's coming, and for 70 years, you're going to be exiled from the city. But I won't forget you. I will restore what is mine. So I just want to show you real quickly what this looks like before we get to the text, of what it looks like in three moments. There are three deportations that we see in Scripture. The first is the court, those that would be of solid standing. This happened in 606 BC and it's encapsulated in the book of Daniel. That's the first deportation. The second is the craftsman. This happened in 597 BC and this is in the book of Ezekiel. And then the last happens in spaces, but it's the rest of the people. By 586, Nebuchadnezzar takes over the rest. This is decimating to the people. And remember, Jeremiah says 70 years. After 70 years, I will begin to bring you back. Well, there are three returns that we're going to look through in Scripture, through Ezra and into Nehemiah, that happen. The first is with Zerubbabel. The first return happens in 537 B.C. 50,000 people by decree of Cyrus and into Darius's line of reign, allow 50,000 people to go back into greater Jerusalem to restore what, what was broken. Let me just tell you what I believe about how God moves. God can use good and bad for his glory. He always does and he always will. God's plan will win, period. And so when we sit back in our culture and we declare things like, well, because this person's in office or that person's in office, we're ruined. I think how we should pray is God use that person for your glory. Let them pursue you and all they've got. God, instead of me letting my prejudice take place, would you win, Lord? And he will. Because God's plans are final. What's going to happen in Revelation that we just read is going to happen. Mark it down. So after Zerubbabel and the 50,000, the next return is Ezra. And he brings with him 1,800 people. And this is in 458 uh, after Artaxerxes declares him to go. And then we get to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the last return in 444 B.C., Nehemiah is sent back, and we know, to rebuild the walls. We'll get to Nehemiah in a few weeks. But I want to spend some time with you in this joint history and explain to you why it matters how they rebuilt and why it should matter to our church today. It matters that we read God's Word because it all is useful. It is all teaching, and it all matters because if all Scripture is God-breathed, what breath of God don't you want? We should read his word. So, we're in our Bible reading plan, reading through the New Testament again and Psalms and Proverbs, but if you want to take one more step with me, over the next two months, if you want to take the challenge, read Ezra and Nehemiah. Just join me in reading it. I promise you, if you spent 10 minutes every morning reading Scripture, you could read through it all. I promise you that. It's not difficult. You may not understand it all, and that's okay. That's why you should come to things like life group. Our life group leaders in our church spend an amazing amount of time preparing their hearts and reading through Scripture and going through commentaries so that they can give to you good, solid, biblical teaching. 
And I hope that you'll come to our life group hour and spend that time learning and brushing elbows with other believers. It matters. It matters in your walk with the Lord that you keep refining your understanding of Scripture. It matters. And I promise you this, our life group leaders are second to none. They desperately seek the face of the Lord, and you should come hear what God has put on their hearts. It's worth your time. I promise you that. But in Ezra chapter 1, here's what the text says. We're going to read from verse 1 down to about, I don't know, verse 9. So, or verse 11. So join me in this. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken through who? Jeremiah. Remember he said, after 70 years, I'm going to restore it? Boom, it happens. God speaks to a foreign king who does not worship him. And he says, here's what you're going to do. And I want to tell you something. Even bad dudes, by inspiration of a holy God, can do the right thing. And this is what happens right now. The Lord roused the spirit of King Cyrus to issue a proclamation through his entire kingdom and to put it in writing. This matters, by the way. It's more than him just saying it. He writes it down. So there's a proclamation that goes out. This is what's going to happen. So if anybody goes, he didn't say that, they could go, yeah, he did. He wrote it down. That's why it matters. Here's what it says. This is what the king Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of the heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you, uh, may his God be with him. And may he go to Jerusalem and Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor wherever he resides, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock, along with their free will offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. So the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, along with the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had roused, prepared to go up and rebuild the Lord's house in Jerusalem. I want to stop here just so that you can understand what's happening. God's spirit was going to inspire people to go. And when God says go you better go. There's a blessing that happens. And I want to tell you, in that blessing, it doesn't mean safety. And I want you to know this for certain. God never promised your happiness. He promised you holiness if you dwell with him. So if you're in pursuit of God because you want to be happy, I promise you this, this world is evil. And it wants to still kill and destroy in your life. So your happiness is not a concern. Your holiness is. And when God says go, he's asking you to go in pursuit of holiness. It may not mean that you're happy along the way. And in this moment, there are so many people that are involved in this movement. There is people that have been old, that have seen the former kingdom before it was destroyed and while it was being destroyed. And there are people that have never seen it before. Seventy years has gone by. There is people that have been born and are full-grown adults that have never stepped foot in Jerusalem. And here they are, roused by God's Spirit, heading that way. This is an amazing moment. Verse 5 says this, So the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, which, by the way, is who built up Judah. Do you see it yet? These two family lines are the two family lines that make up that area. So those two family lines, Judah and Benjamin, along with the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God aroused were prepared to go up and rebuild the Lord's house in Jerusalem. All of their neighbors supported them. And I love, by the way, how King James says this. It says, supported their hands. I love that. It strengthened their hands. And this is how they did it. They supported them with silver articles, gold, goods, livestock, and valuables, in addition to all that was given as freewill offering. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and placed in the hands of his gods. Here's what happens in this moment. Not only do we get that King Cyrus states it and writes it that they can go back, he looks back at his former predecessor who stole the items out of God's house, and he says, this belongs to your God. Take it with you. This is mesmerizing. He could have said, rebuild it. Do it all. Redefine, rebuild, redo, but he goes, here's all of God's stuff that my predecessor gave to his gods. Take it back home to yours. 
This is powerful. This is amazing. This is God-inspired. King Cyrus of Persia, verse 8 says, had them brought out under the supervision of Mithridoth, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shebarzar, the prince of Judah. This was the inventory, 30 gold basins, 1,000 silver basins, 20 silver knives, 1,000, or pardon me, uh, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls and a thousand other articles. And the gold and silver articles totaled 5,400. Shebazar brought all of them when the exiles went up out of Babylon to Jerusalem. Not only would they be traveling back, they'd be bringing God's stuff with them. This is powerful. I got to tell you what's happening in this moment is transcendent. What's happening in this moment is so Bible-connected that you got to know that Ezra and Nehemiah play such a huge role in this return that you got to know the books that are around it. So let me just give you a few of those. Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi are all wrapped into this timetabling. All this major biblical history is going to lay out all together, which is why we must study God's Word. It's why we as Bible studiers need to look into timelines to understand what's happening. Because when you realize that this is all happening, and all of a second, when, when all this is happening, Haggai the prophet starts speaking to the people, or Zechariah or Malachi starts speaking into the people. Did you know that in the book of Esther, there's a pa- or pardon me, in the book of Ezra, there's a pause. Between chapters 5 and 6, there's a natural pause in timeline. And in that basic pausing of timeline is the book of Esther. That's when it happens. Is it any wonder how God breathes Scripture? Now, I want you to know something. Your Bible is not written incorrectly. Don't go, well, if it was written correctly, wouldn't you just throw the book right there? No, this is laid out for a reason. But as a Bible studier, you need to learn your biblical timelines. Because when you do, all of a sudden the Bible will come more and more alive before you. You'll start to understand why this prophet's talking to the people about continuing on and holding on to the things of God and why they say it. Man, it's so meaningful to know that God had a plan from the very beginning of time that would intersect and he would speak to a people that eventually you and I could learn so much from. God has a plan for you in Scripture. You should read it. You should study it. You should become a scholar. You should learn it because it matters to you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to write the next great book. Listen, I don't believe that God's really interested in having a church worth of authors. I think he's interested in having a church worth of people that pursue holiness and have understanding and reason why. You and I are called to be holy because he's holy. And so we should know how to act. And the only way we know how to act is how to follow the rules of God. The book of Ezra is filled with vision. The leadership of God. Opposition from outsiders. Challenges to return to the way and hard choices to uphold God's standard. It's a deep book. It's a difficult book. There's heartbreaking moments, there's heroism, and there's absolute heartbreak, and there's change. Let me just give you a few insights from this very first part of Ezra. God will not only make a way for his people, but he'll also resource it. When you pursue God, he's going to resource your pursuit. That doesn't mean that if you say, well, God's called me to start a Fortune 500, Listen, if God ordains that step, he's going to resource it. But it doesn't mean that every plan that you have, he supports. His ways and our ways are different. His thoughts and our thoughts are different. So we need to spend time with the holy God to understand his way. I believe that God has a plan for your life, and it looks like this, your holiness. The rest of it is a work in progress. (laughs) It may mean that your holiness means that you must become poor. Don't believe me? Look into the life of Job. It may mean your death. Don't believe me? Look at the life of the disciples. I'm just telling you today, a pursuit of God may not mean your joy and happiness. 
in an earthly sense. Sometimes I believe in Scripture tells us our greatest suffering is what connects us to Christ. And Scripture tells us that, I, I got to tell you, it may mean that we're a little bit less comfortable in our pursuit of Christ. In my life, and I'm sure in yours, we can both agree that we have followed the ways of the world and its pursuit of joy and happiness only for it to lead us into stress and misery. But God called that you would live free. God called that you would have a hope in a future, but that's only based in him. Here's the other thing I can see from Ezra chapter 1. God will restore what is his. Amen. He has not forgotten what's his. He will restore the things that bear his image. Let me take a detour for a second in Scripture. And I'll tell you, over the next few weeks, we're going to dive further into Zerubbabel and into Ezra and ultimately Nehemiah. But today I want to conclude our time with a thought that came from the New Testament. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus is given an interesting moment. Don't be misled. Jesus was always challenged. Always. Everywhere he went, somebody wanted to catch him being contrary to God's word. They just didn't realize God's word was walking amongst them. <laughs> he wasn't going to miss a beat because he is the word. And so in this moment, in Mark chapter 12, verse 13, it says this, They sent some of the Pharisees, and the Herodians to Jesus to trap him in his words. When they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you're faithful or truthful and don't care what people think, nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God truthfully. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? This is a trap. Here's why. These are not the only people that are there that day. There are those that would listen in on behalf of Rome. And they're hoping that Jesus will misstep in this moment. I think it's fascinating how they talk to him. You're truthful. You're impartial. Uh, you, you're, you're good. So tell us, should we pay our taxes? It says this, but Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought him a coin. Whose image and inscription is this, he asked them. Caesar, they replied, and Jesus told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's, and they were, amazed, or they were utterly amazed at him. Amen. Let me ask you a question. If the coin had Caesar's image, what are the things that bear the image of God? What bears God's image? Genesis 1.27 says this, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God, and he created them male and female, which means this today. If you're one of my sisters in Christ, or whether you're not, you still bear the image of your creator. Amen. Men in this room, whether you're a believer or not, you bear the image of the creator. Amen. This month will be the Sanctity of Human Life Month which means they're asking people in churches everywhere to celebrate the sanctity of human life. We live in a day and time where um, certainly the Supreme Court has stood on behalf of life, but the people of our country do not. I believe this wounds the heart of the Creator. I'm very thankful that I know artists in my life, like Brother Jim Burleson, who spends countless hours working on paintings, who tries his best to do shadowing and waterworks, and these things are not done by novices like me. And a true artist breathes out creation as they have brush strokes. And it would be a true travesty that at the end of an artist's painting, you and I walk in and kick a hole in that artwork. Not only would it be a cost lost in, in just you know, the sheer um, items, the paint cost, the canvas cost. It would also be a loss of time. 
But even that's not the greatest loss. The greatest loss would be the loss of a work of art. And in our culture, you and I need to identify a few things. When we take human life, it's not just the loss of person. It's not just the loss of time. It's the loss of an artist. And I got to tell you, there will be a judgment. There will be a moment where the artist returns. And shame on us for being a culture that so willfully takes the work of an artist and ruins it at the sake of luxury, or at the sake of money, and at the sake of support. So let me say this, church. When a young woman enters this building and is pregnant and chooses not to be, our job as the church is to tell that young woman, we are with you. We will help you. We will support you. And we will come alongside you. We will not let you do this alone. We will be with you. So keep the art. Keep the life. Because it matters to our God And it matters to us. We love you and we will walk with you. We will be there with you. It is not enough for us to stand on our political soapboxes in judgment. We must suffer on their behalf. We must love deeply. And we must pray earnestly, oh God, spare our society and spare our country. It so easily destroys your work. You are bought with a price. The blood of Christ is not free. It's holy. And it is valuable. And you and I in Christ have been bought with that blood. Therefore, you and I must honor God with all we've got. And that means we must keep his principles and his ways, no matter our decisioning and thoughts. His thoughts are better than ours. His ways are better than ours. So we better start looking more like him and less like us. Colossians 3 says this, Therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. Oh, God, spare our country. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them, but now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old self with its practices, and you have put on the new self, you are being renewed in knowledge according to what? The image of your creator. The artist has signed your work. You're his. You're his. So you and I bear the image of the creator. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. But give to God what's God's. You bear his image. Give him all you got. Give him everything. Fall deeply in love with the creator. Know the artist, and it'll change your life. In my inner office is a painting. It's a painting that I saw all my childhood growing up. It was in the home of my great-grandfather. He's a farmer. Um, He was just a simple man. Time had weathered him down. He was short. Um, He was hunchbacked because he grew up in the time of farming where you bent over for everything, so he was hunched over. He was a godly man. Carried a New Testament in his pocket that I've got in my office. We called him great because he was our great-grandfather. He liked being called great. But great had a painting on the wall that was in his living room. My grandmother, who is in heaven with my great-grandfather, took me to his house one day and said, Kyle, what would you want from your great-grandfather? I said, I don't want that. I want the painting. I probably could have asked for a lot of things. Old pocket knives, his boots, which I have, his cowboy hat, which I have. But I wanted the painting. 
So my great-grandfather went, okay, I was thinking that meant when he passed. He'd write me in the will that Kyle gets the painting. That day, my great-grandfather walked over and pulled it off the wall. Completely sunbaked, with the exception of where that painting had hung. And he said, take it. It's yours. You see, on that painting is a signature of an artist. You may see it and go, it's just a painting. It has Lewis Kinley's signature on it. And you may say, who cares? It's Lewis Kinley. He is a farmer. To me, he's my family. You see, because I know him. He spoke over me. When I was five, in his living room, he said, one day you're going to be a preacher. I was five. I rejected that, by the way. Who wants to be a preacher? But I want to tell you something today. Every time I see that painting, it speaks to me. It doesn't speak to me about Lewis Kinley. It doesn't speak to me about my great-grandfather. I know the artist. So it means something to me because he's the artist. And I know him. And I'm his legacy. Every brushstroke on that painting is me. Every moment and hour he spent doing trees or bushes or the little church house that's in that painting is me. You bear the brushstrokes of your Savior. And whether you've walked with him for years or you don't know him at all, you are his masterpiece. You are created exactly the way he wants you to be, with one exception. You need to know the artist. You need to know the artist because the enemy is going to tell you you're worthless, that you don't have what it takes, that you'll never overcome. But my God, the true artist is a God of breakthroughs. He is an overcomer. Even death, he is the victor. And so today, I pray you'll know the artist. He is going to return the things that are his. You are his. You bear his image. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. But give to God you. You bear his image. To become the church we should be. The people in this room need to be artist renderings that know the artist. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me make this very simple. Uh, Salvation is not difficult. It's childlike in effect. It means this, belief and confession. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is a God that saw sin, he emptied himself, came in the form of a servant, and died on a cross so that your sins and my sins could be covered by holy blood sacrifice. What's more is he didn't just die. Three days later, he rose again, conquering death and making a way for every single person through him to not just live but to conquer death as well. If you believe that, the next is confession, not to me, but to him. God, I believe you are who you say you are. And I give you my life in response. Lead and guide me. Direct me what to do next. I want to bear your image well. He will lead you. He will save you. He's going to change you. That's what my prayer is every day. Lord, change me and make me more into the image of Christ. God, make me holy. He's going to do it for you, and he's going to do it for me. Let's pray and ask him to do that in our lives today. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we believe what Scripture says about Jesus. We want to make our confession before you and declare that without you, we have nothing, just an empty canvas. But God, you are so good that you sent Jesus as a way and a path forward towards holiness. Lord, Scripture tells us that Nothing that's unholy could ever enter into heaven. And so without Jesus, we are wrecked. But because of Jesus, 
He's the way, the truth, and the life. And we need that. Lord, we want to know you as the author and perfecter of our faith. We want to know the artist. So God, would you lead us to be believing confessors of you? Lord, with that, we would be saved. So God, speak in this moment. Lord, breathe over us truth. Lord, breathe over us life. Lord, we pray in this next few moments that change would happen, that salvation would happen. And Lord Jesus, that you would speak and bring salvation to someone that desperately needs you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.